time is now. So, hi there, I'm Jordan Bush. I work on embedded system engineering to build RF communication devices. Uh, I've been learning about a very broad range of topics with an SDR ever since I built my first police scanner in 2017 because they use digital modulation. Uh, since then, I've continued to learn more about RF technology and it's only bloomed. I got my amateur license in 2021 and I've kept going from there. Uh, I got into chasing weather balloons in 2021 and I've enjoyed chasing them since. Started reverse engineering them and trying to learn what we can do with them post launch. So, what is a weather balloon? A weather balloon is used to collect some measurements in the, from the ground to near space and it includes temperature, humidity, wind, uh, sometimes pressure. Uh, here in the United States, they typically launch two balloons daily, although currently with special conditions with the hurricanes and stuff, they're actually launching them four times a day. Currently there is one in the air, uh, headed toward Holden, Missouri, I believe. Uh, good change. This data is used to calculate things such as storm severity, uh, wind models that are used to predict what wind patterns will go through, cold fronts, etc. The data is collected from up to 100,000 feet in the air, and after that, the Weather Service doesn't collect any more data from that. Uh, it's pretty much just falling back down from a parachute to Earth. Uh, it's still transmitting, so we're able to collect the data and uh, find it ourselves. Um, let's see. So, in terms of what a weather balloon is, I've loaded the components here on an image so we can kind of get an idea of what we're looking at. Uh, so right here is the balloon. Typically it's just a latex balloon up in the air. They can expand to about 50 some feet. So about a two car garage once it's fully at atmosphere. Um, here we have parachute rigging. Uh, typically we'll probably just see a parachute on North American models, but in other countries they might have different ways of handling the cord. Um, some, I believe Australia uses radio reflectors to help show uh, the weather balloons on radar for their air traffic. Um, and then we have a little payload, which I'll refer to as a radio sonde. Uh, radio sonde standing for radio, and then it's French for communicator, so radio communicator. Uh, or radio pro, my mistake. Um, and then just for the nerds out here, that is a AccuLock radio sonde that was flown around the 1980s. So, chasing a radio song, what do you need to know? Here's a little comprehensive guide. I, I thought I might cover this first because I'm sure this is going to be a question if I don't answer it now. Um, radio songs are completely, like once the weather service uses them, they don't have the resources to go recover them. So once they're done, they just have a little label that says, please dispose of it properly. Um, so really there's no issue with collecting them. Um, the National Weather Service has actually helped us try to get things set up, so uh, there's been times where a frequency has been kind of messed up, where a frequency was misaligning with the software-defined radios we've used. So for example, uh, one of them has a issue where it can't receive a certain frequency. Well, I believe Omaha is using that frequency, and they helped out. So. They're supportive of what we do. They like to see us recycling them and using them for better purposes. Um, now I will say the rules of trespassing do not change. So don't just go hop a fence trying to find a weather balloon. You might get in trouble uh, you know, with that happening. When I mean, you can, try to knock on people's doors, ask for permission, and uh, explain what you're doing. And make sure it's obvious, pretty much everything on this slide. Otherwise, people think you're strange. So, uh, to start chasing weather balloons, uh, you'll want to go to sondhub.org. This is a website that basically has crowdsourced information about weather balloons, and it shows you kind of all over the country, all over the world, where weather balloons are going. This image is a little outdated. Um, this was taken probably about a month ago. Uh, back then, the weather balloon was actually going southwest. Uh, if you go to the website right now, you'll be able to track the current one in the air. Um, 
I'll go ahead and uh, pull that up so you can see it better. Uh, so right here you have little green dots. That's our crowdsourced receivers. Uh, somebody's a donator. Over here, this is Topeka, Kansas, where they have their National Weather Service launch station. Uh, they have multiple around the area, 92 in total in the United States. Um, and then with the website, you're able to generate predictions. So this was taken about a week ago, and it shows basically kind of in the area where things are expected to go. So right now we're probably around here. Uh, when you click on Topeka, there's a button you can click to generate predictions up to two weeks, which allow you to kind of judge where you, like, is it going to go to your area, and whether or not it's worth trying to chase. So right now, conditions are pretty optimal to find these around the Kansas City area. Um, and not much equipment is required. Essentially, what you need to have is a Raspberry Pi, maybe a ESP32 with a radio attached to it, or even a HackerF, although I'll tell you this, it's not good to use because they don't have, I mean, they built a decoder, but it's not the best in terms of the other two that I mentioned. Um, I'll go ahead and go into more detail. So here's what I recommend. So for the PC software, it's called RadioSon Auto RX. It's made by a couple group, uh, a couple guys out in Australia. Um, and it's basically a web interface built in Python that takes an RTL SDR and it will decode and show you where weather balloons are automatically. So for this example, I don't think I have a zoomed in picture, but I was out in Arkansas. I had a antenna just sitting out, out in the open, and I was able to pick up four different weather balloons from all the neighboring states. Uh, for a cheaper barrier to entry, there is a microcontroller board that you can buy. Uh, costs about 25 bucks on Alibaba and you can load up firmware to it and it automatically tracks the weather balloons around you. I will say there is a caveat, it only tracks two different kinds of weather balloons. Lucky for us in the United States, those are the kind that we receive. Although if there's like a rare launch or if you go to Europe with this one, there might be a chance that it might not be able to pick up every single one. I'll mention that now. Yeah, it didn't work until recently because it didn't pick up the ones that Topeka was launching until they switched over. Yeah, they just recently switched over in July, so consider yourselves lucky. Um, I'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> uh, so when you get to the landing area of the radio sawn, you need to consider what you might have to encounter when you try to go get it. Uh, in some circumstances, you'll probably have to get permission to enter wherever you're going. Um, when finding the weather balloon, I would highly recommend looking at a satellite view of the area that you're going to go into so you can kind of judge what kind of terrain you might have to face. There has been times when I had to cross through like brush and creeks, uh, so you really have to consider what you're going to be looking for. Uh, if you know you can go up to an area where it's kind of open, uh, it's easy to get. Sometimes you have to wear a sleeve of clothing just to kind of stay out of the brush. And uh, lastly, there are times when weather balloons will fall into trees. Now, sometimes you can just go up to the tree and pick it out. Other times you'll need to get like a pole and take like a retractable pole, fish it out, and most of the time that works, but there has been instances where a weather balloon has fallen 50 feet in the air and I wasn't able to get it out. Um, yes? No, and I have avoided catching a weather balloon out of some place that did have dogs. Uh, I was going to try to get permission to get on the property, but they were barking at the door, and I was like, mm, not worth it. <laughs> uh, here's a couple finds that I found. Uh, if you look, that one's actually fallen into a lake. That was the first one I actually chased. Uh, and we have some that just kind of fall on the ground. Nothing special to get that one. How'd you get the one in the, the water out? Uh, so, me and another guy, we took an, like an extension cord, just a plain old extension cord, and we uh, took a little piece of copper wire and bent it into a hook, attached it to the end, and we literally chucked at it probably for 20 minutes until we hooked the little uh, cord. So you have to keep in mind, between the parachute and the actual payload, there's about a 50-foot cord. So we hooked into it and reeled it in. And that was probably my most unique experience trying to find one. Um, if you see here, 
Some of them landed too high in a tree where I can't get it. Uh, that one was actually in a tree for months on end, and I just happened to hear about it. I drove out and got it. Uh, that was one that I was able to get with my pole, kind of easy once you know how to do it. Uh, that was in a tree, I was able to just walk up and pick it out. So it can vary dramatically. So let's get into the fun stuff. Hacking and modifying these weather balloons. So I'll be talking about three different models today. We have the Lockheed Martin, we have the Visala, and we have the Graal. The Lockheed Martin was uh, used primarily in the United States from about 2011 to 2022. They just kind of finished up that cycle with the contracts. Uh, we were one of the last stations to still use it. Uh, like I said, we discontinued use of this one in July. So you probably won't find it except maybe at NASA launches. Uh, they use both 400 free megahertz and 1.6 gigahertz. Uh, one reason they're also switching over is cellular bands. I believe changed with that. Um, and uh, we've also kind of moved on from other technologies. Uh, one thing to know about these, they use older technology. Uh, they actually adapted to design from the 90s. They changed a couple things around over the years. But if you look at like their version from earlier, you can kind of see the same kind of designs. For the Visala RS-41, it's currently in use worldwide. We recently transitioned to it in the Kansas City area. So if you want to go haunt a weather balloon, this is most likely what you'll find. They're all on 400 free megahertz. Um, they use newer chipsets such as an STM32, U-Block's uh, generation, or sixth generation GPS, and a uh, sub gigahertz transmitter. Uh, for the Graal DFM-17, that's another kind that's also kind of split between the RS-41 and the DFM-17. Uh, they're seeing the United States as well. Omaha and Springfield launch them. So if you're up north or down south, you'll most likely find these. Um, currently, the firmware is not as good as the Visala has been doing, um, mainly because this is a newer tech. This one just got recently released in 2020. Uh, it started flying this year. Uh, I'll get into more about custom firmware later in this talk. But uh, that's kind of a brief overview of each model. So, this is the Lockheed Martin LMS-6 radio song. It ran a ST7 8-bit CPU, and it required a special dongle in order to flash it, um, which didn't run cheap compared to the other options. It also required special software to develop and write software just for it, um, which were licensed, you couldn't just do anything with it, so ended up using a virtual machine and we had to reset the license every time we wanted to change anything with it. Um, it has a Texas Instruments UHF transmitter. Uh, you might recognize the CC1050, it's similar to what's used in the Flipper Zero if anyone has one, that's the CC1100, I believe. Um, and for programming this one, you basically have to use a edge interface, and that was developed by uh, our guy Reed right over here. So give good thanks for him later. Essentially, uh, the edge connector provided test and calibration interfaces to assist the development and Q and A for this weather balloon. Um, in order for us to program it, we had to build out a header, and we connected up to a ST7 flasher. Um, again, I mentioned that one takes special software and isn't the easiest to develop for, so I'm kind of glad that's gone. Uh, although I will say, in order for the firmware, uh, this one was actually the easiest to dump the firmware. There was no readout protection, so we were able to dump and modify the firmware. Uh, looking at it, we saw that the version number was May 2017. The other one, the 1.6 gigahertz model, was dated 2009, I believe. Um, it isn't supported by uh, Gehidra, so we had to use Ida Pro in order to reverse engineer it. And I'll go ahead and give a little visual representation of the firmware. Uh, you can definitely see there was some optimization made. They had most of the drivers in this block of code. They had like their transmission software in this block of code. And then customization data such as calibration offsets and serial numbers were stored in that block of code. So 
It's a lot more optimized than any of the other models we'll look at. Uh, although I think this is really the only one I have a full firmware done for. Uh, so about that customization block, I was able to essentially dump the firmware and I was able to use a search tool to find that there's a certain offset where I could set the hex bits to change my serial number. So what do I do? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, and then we'll find my thing now. <laughs> um, so flashing these, it's very easy. You just dump, change, flash. Uh, for the LMS6, we were also able to change the frequency. This one actually was a little more advanced. It took me a little more time to understand. But essentially, we dump the firmware. And on this firmware, uh, in order to change the frequency, there are certain dip switches. So there's four different dip switches to change the firmware. And I don't believe I attached an image, but on the back of it, it gives you a little readout. You can change which switch to change the frequency. Um, for this one, I basically just looked at that, and I set one of the presets. So when you have all the switches flipped up, I was able to change the frequency register using a calculator um, provided by Texas Instruments. And I was able to change the frequency to an amateur frequency band, so we're able to transmit semi-legally. I mean, I don't believe we were able to figure out how to identify call some official firmware, but it got closer and out of band from what the National Weather Service used at the time. Um, moving forward, uh, one thing I'd like to see happen if we ever do have somebody work on the LMS 6 radio song, uh, on the official firmware, we never fully decoded the temperature and humidity. Uh, we got very close. We had the information in order to change the offsets of the temperature and humidity for this weather balloon. Although I believe by the time we were actually planning on implementing it, uh, the changeover process started happening and most people kind of went over to the next generation. Uh, I know I did. Um, although I think we, did. we got close, I'll say that. Um, so that's kind of a wrap up for that one. For the RS-41, this is probably the one you're going to see most commonly. Uh, it's got the STM32 F100 CPU, and it has a couple vulnerabilities, I believe. Um, it's got CV2028004, which is a vulnerability where you can actually go into the debugging interface and cause a dump in a certain way where it will actually dump bytes of the memory. Um, now we can't fully bypass readout protection with that one. Um, 2023 uh, talks about voltage glitching on another series of STM32 boards that is very similar to this one. Essentially, you take voltage glitching to change the firmware and or change the uh, bytes whenever it's uh, booting up. I haven't I haven't been able to test that one yet, but that's something to be tested with in the future. Uh, for the GPS, it's using a 6th generation U-Blocks GPS, which has a 2.5 meter accuracy, roughly. Um, and this one makes hunting these a lot easier to find in terms of accuracy when you're trying to find them on the ground. Uh, it hasn't been a huge challenge if you kind of know the approximate area, but it only makes it easier, especially when you're trying to find ones that are lodged in trees and you can't see the parachute on the ground. Um, it's got a Silicon Labs. 4032 ISM transmitter. Uh, it goes from 200 to, I believe, around 800 megahertz. So unfortunately, we can't use this one with the VHF band, which if you were going to try to use this with uh, the ham radio APERS transmissions, it's out of the picture. Um, if you get one of these, please don't try to power your badge using the AA batteries. They won't work. For the programming interface, this is probably going to be a piece of cake. This is the easiest one to do. Um, behind this little styrofoam thing, there's a programming interface, just a couple pins. Uh, highly recommend just picking up a $10 ST link and trying to program one of these. It's super easy to do. All you have to do is just take some uh, jumper wires and hook into it, uh, and you'll be having your own custom firmware in a couple minutes. Uh, I will say about custom firmware. This is the only one to feature a fully featured custom firmware at the moment. It's called RS41NG. Not related to the model number that the United States uses, but that just happened to be a coincidence. 
It supports uh, APERS, which is very common with amateur radio position reporting. Um, one thing you can do with that is you can actually take the weather balloon, flash the firmware, put it in your car, and you can track your car. I know a lot of radio amateurs like to do that. It's a very cheap entry point for a lot of people. Um, another one is the four frequency shift key method. Um, that is a kind of transmission that a lot of amateur balloonists like to use to track their weather balloons. It allows them to transmit certain kinds of data, and I believe, I think you can transmit pictures with it too. I'm not too sure. I gotta look into that. But it's uh, commonly used whenever people are transmitting on static balloons where they want to try to travel the world, and that's one way to test it. Uh, let's see. Uh, right now, I'm actually working on a project to try to bring LoRa over to the RS-41 balloon. Uh, I found that I could attach a LoRa chip to the SPI bus as they had a little trace for their military model where they had SPI flash because they would store and forward the data. Um, so I essentially built a little bodge wire going to a LoRa chip that I stick bugged. And so far, I'm working on writing the firmware for that. Uh, official firmware didn't accept it. It actually caused a crash. And I'm guessing because it probably received an invalid response. Although at some point I'd like to make this because we have more lower wind receivers than we do Cordis um, 4SK or 4 frequency shift key uh, receivers. So I want to try to get this working so we have a global network that we can receive from. And to do right now, the sensor boom that contains the proprietary sensors is not supported. Um, as you can see, it has a temperature and humidity sensor on the end. Uh, I believe some efforts were made to reverse engineer it, but we haven't figured out the offsets or maybe it was the command that we used to pull the temperature from it. Um, and one thing I'd like to see, this is more of a dream if anything, is something in Kansas City where people are launching balloons. Uh, kind of ironic actually, I believe somebody recorded a video. Uh, somebody launched a balloon just down the street while we were here. Um, I'm not sure who it was affiliated with, but I don't think it was amateur. Um, let's see. And then for the DFM-17, so this is kind of why I've been all over. Uh, I started reverse engineering this one back when it first launched in October 2021. Uh, it's got a very similar chipset and board layout to the RS-41. It's got a stm 2 f 100 just like the other RS-41, it's probably vulnerable to the same kind of exploits. Um, I've been able to do a partial dump of the firmware, however, that's something I'll probably have to consult somebody else to help me with. Uh, it's got a U-Block EF Generation GPS chip. Um, that's pretty state-of-the-art as we speak. I believe it has, I think, like 0.1 meter accuracy, so it's a lot more accurate than previous models. We got a Silicon Labs 406 free transmitter. Um, this one supports VHF transmissions, so you will be able to possibly use this for APERS once that firmware is built for it. And then it also uses two CR123A batteries, not the same that the one used, um, which these are kind of like the old camera flash batteries. You probably won't see them used in pretty much anything except maybe specific purpose devices. And uh, kind of looking at the programming interface, it wasn't as pretty as the RS-41. Some assemblies required. It's a really bad photo. Um, but I had to add a little debug interface to the card. And once I did that, I was able to hook up an ST link right to it and program it. And it also had something that I thought was a USB port. I mean, who else would think, oh yeah, that has to be it. And uh, it turns out it's actually running serial over that, which I believe they use for programming and potential expansions. So ozone sensors, for example. Um, I spent a while looking at that thinking, oh yeah, that has to be how they program it. Because it, it, it took five volts and I didn't fry the board. But it uh, turns out they're using that in a different way and I have a feeling they're doing that so they can sell a dongle. My words, not theirs. Uh, ongoing work. I'm currently working on importing RS-41 NG over to the DFM-17. Uh, pretty much everything is currently working except for the transmitter. Uh, so I'm kind of just trying different experiments, trying to get it working. 
Uh, I think that image kind of relates to how I feel right now. Um, so eventually, it will probably have the same kind of features as the other one does with the addition of being able to transmit lower frequency bands, which might be very beneficial to the radio amateur. So here's a little overview. Um, the LMS-6 kind of has a couple things you can do to it, but in terms of being able to have the same flexibility, it's just not there. Uh, partially has something to do with the fact that it's using older chips that are kind of harder to program. And most people don't want to download proprietary software and learn how to program for a very, you know, end of life chip. Uh, for the Basella RS41, you're probably at the cream of the crop right there at the moment. It's got fully featured hardware and software. Uh, I believe there's even schematics on the internet you can download for this one if you want to build anything custom onto it. Uh, easiest to program by far with the programming pins being right there. Uh, and for the DFM-17, it's making its way. It still has a little to do. Uh, just have to write the firmware fully for it. I will say the programming interface isn't the best to work with, but it, it's okay. Um, I'd really like to see this one be used as like an APERS tracker eventually. We'll see where that goes. So that's kind of an overview of what you can do with these when you find them. Um, I'm sure there's probably more things we can find. Uh, for example, right now, uh, we actually have a little challenge going on. You can go look around if you have like a radio handheld uh, I believe if you talk to the RF village, you can get the frequencies. But there are a couple of these by sell RS41s around the building, transmitting a challenge. And if you're close enough, you can pick up the signal and do some radio direction finding to find it, and snap a picture, and get some sort of reward. I'm not sure what it is off the top of my head. Uh, additional projects. So outside of just working on the weather balloons themselves, there are a couple things that the community has done that kind of help facilitate catching and chasing weather balloons, as well as launching weather balloons. Um, so like one of those is Sonhub Amateur. So as you can see here, I flew my own balloon, kind of like the Up movie, if you've seen that. Um, so essentially, you can register and launch your own payloads. So for example, that's the RS-41 NG firmware that's running on that RS-41. Um, I believe that flew almost to Tennessee although I didn't have any tracker to verify that, but it was kind of on the, uh, pressure, the static pressure layer, so it was being held up where it wasn't really ascending or descending, and it wasn't bursting in the air. Um, here is a project that I worked on called Balloonie. It's essentially a Discord bot that monitors and alerts people whenever weather balloons are up in the air. It also tracks and tells you where a balloon is expected to go and what time it's expected to go. It's basically a briefing. Uh, in fact, it went off earlier today before I gave this talk saying that Topeka had launched a weather balloon and it's currently flying in the air. Uh, maybe later today you might be able to go chase it if you're interested. Uh, it might be a little bit of a drive unless you live out east. Uh, so that was a nice little project that I think is kind of useful for both me and other people in this community. It's open source and yes? My question, um, do you ever go to give a balloon or somebody else there? Uh, so there has been an instance where I went after a balloon and it was like in a field area. Somebody on a combine had already picked up the balloon. It was on the back of their tractor and I was trying to get their attention. I couldn't get it. Uh, so that was kind of a waste of time for me, but I did get to see it at least. Uh, that one actually drove out to Fort Riley and it was right outside and I still didn't get it. But I got to see it. <laughs> I got a photo somewhere on my phone. Uh, but as I mentioned, this is open source. If you live outside of the Kansas City community and you like to use this for your own purpose, it is up there, it runs Docker, so it's really easy to set up. I encourage it. Uh, spread the word. Uh, Song Predict is another software program written by another fellow in the SecDC community. It provides a prediction system for people who want to track weather balloons. Uh, and this also works locally, so you don't need to use sonhub.com or org whenever you want to try to find them. So say you're out on the go, where internet might not be the easiest to come by, you can download prediction data for up to two weeks. Uh, usually you're able to track it, and it's a nice little software suite. Uh, it's already pre-configured for certain areas, so any of those areas apply to you. Well, 
congratulations. You can go to that website and it will show you kind of where the launches are without having to uh, rely on one website. So it's a nice little way to decentralize predictions. Uh, any questions? Yes? How long do the batteries usually last coming out of uh, typically they last about 10 or 11 hours. So you will have a decent chance with the current models. Uh, there are some models that last about six. And I think I've encountered rare occurrences where some last only four or three. But usually they'll last enough for the flight. And then like the ones that currently launched by Topeka, they have a long track record according to what people have done in research. So. Yeah, you'll have a good time trying to find one if you wait a little bit after it reaches the ground. Anything else? Yeah? For your own balloon, have you thought about using transceiver? Uh, yeah, um, I thought about that, and there has been a group that I know, uh, I believe Independence Kansas, which is kind of south Kansas. They actually launched a crosstalk repeater where people were able to voice up and hear their voice down. Uh, I believe I did try to transmit to it, but I didn't get through. Um, that was a really cool project, and I know there are other people around the area who probably have done similar things, but you're probably going to have to make custom hardware for that. You can't modify one of these to do that unless you really change a lot of stuff about it. Yes? What's the typical flight duration for balloons that launches, goes to burst height, and so, drops? Typically in the spring, the fall, sometimes the winter, they'll usually head east, um, usually last about 50 to 100 miles, and they'll travel for about two hours. Um, during the summer, this is usually kind of the phase when the pressure up, up high is kind of different, and the balloons will kind of go in a circular pattern around where they were launched, and they'll usually fall about 20 miles from where they went. Uh, so chasing there during the summer isn't really a good time, especially considering the vegetation is all over the place, so if you have to go through that, it's a pain. Uh, during the coldest parts of the winter, the balloons will actually have a tendency to travel very far east. So there has been times when a Topeka balloon has made it all the way to uh, Illinois. And uh, there's been a time when I was able to grab a balloon out of Dodge City, Kansas, all the way from Riverside, Missouri. That was almost 500 miles. Uh, so it can be really crazy sometimes, but typically it's going to be around two hours or 50 to 100 miles. All right, well, if you have any more questions, you can hit me up on the Twitters. Um, there's the Chasing website for quick reference. This QR code will go to all the links that I've mentioned on my talk. So if you, have, if you want to see more about what I've done or you want to participate, I highly encourage you to scan that link and it'll basically contain everything you need to know about what I just talked about. Um, thank you. Yeah.